um, and good evening and thank you to all of you for coming by. At Shanta, uh, as I was telling some colleagues when we met the, when, when, when we met this morning, Shanta and I have kind of known each other for probably a 50 or 60 years. In fact, uh, our father's careers kind of paralleled each other. They both started in the Ceylon Civil Service and then ended up working for UNDP. So we've known each other for many, many years indeed. Uh, Santa, Santa, Shanta has had an absolutely stellar career. Uh, he did his first degree in mathematics at Princeton, and then did a PhD in economics at Berkeley. Uh, subsequently taught at the Kennedy School in Harvard. And then when the director, Larry Summers was director then, right? When the director of the Kennedy School moved across as chief economist at the World Bank, he took Shanta with him. And Shanta has been at the World Bank since. Um, and uh, he has served as chief economist for South Asia, for Sub-Saharan Africa, for Middle East and North uh, Africa, and currently is the acting chief economist of the World Bank. He is um, going to talk to us about market failure, government failure. I mean, in traditional development economics, uh, it was justifiable to have government intervention when there is market failure. Uh, that was uh, received wisdom for many years. But now as the years have rolled on, um, as Shanta did point out to us when he spoke to some of us this morning, government intervention has, in many instances, turned into government failure. And Shanta, I think this evening is going to help us to understand why that happened. And he has some very novel and interesting ideas as to how one can address this problem of uh, government failure. So with that, let me uh, introduce Shanta, uh, invite Shanta to deliver his lecture. OK, thanks, thanks very much, Indrajit. And it's a real pleasure to be here to see some old friends uh, and also make some new friends. Uh, I've given this lecture at, uh, I've given lectures at the Center for Banking Studies before, uh, and it's always been a very rewarding experience. So really, thanks very much for coming. Um, yeah, I, I want to talk about market failure and government failure in the context of India. And uh, some people say, why India? Well, it's only one-sixth of, of humanity. So it's just, it for, as citizens of the world, we should be concerned about India. But I think more generally, the problems of India actually illustrate many, uh, many phenomena that go on in other countries as well, uh, including uh, the one we're in right now. So I thought it would be useful to uh, study it from that angle as well. Now, I think the other point about India is that it's well known are some real successes. Uh, India has probably the second highest, second fastest growth rate of any of the large countries in the world, just second to China over a good 10 to 15 year period. Per capita growth is average about 6% over, uh, over that period. And thanks to this growth, we're seeing a substantial reduction in poverty. So the, the percentage of people living below the poverty line, where the poverty line is the, the World Bank uh, 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 line of $1.90 a day, uh, has fallen by over half. And th these figures are a little outdated, but they're the last published official figures of, of a poverty rate of 21%. There's, there's reason to believe that it might be even closer to 10% as the 2015 uh, numbers uh, uh, come out. So that's really quite a remarkable uh, uh, accomplishment for a country that started out as one of the poorest in the world to come pretty much on par with other lower middle income uh, countries uh, over this period. Now that's the good news. It, behind this, this success story, uh, and it is a success story, there's no question about it, lie some very troubling uh, statistics uh, that I wanted to share with you, because it, it is of, of concern. 
Um, first is that this growth has been accompanied by a steep increase in inequality. Under, in, in various ways, you can measure inequality in various ways. But one of the ways uh, that we, we try to do it is to look at wealth inequality. So going beyond uh, uh, income or consumption inequality and looking at wealth. Now there's limited data, so we don't have it for all countries. But if you look at the sample of countries that uh, Credit Suisse uh, does compute uh, wealth inequality, basically India is the, is the most unequal country in the world. Um, the, it's, you know, people talk about inequality in the United States and, and places like that, but it's actually considerably more unequal uh, in, uh, in India. Now, so and uh, keep that in mind because if, you, as you know, the more unequal is a society, the harder it is to reduce poverty for a given level of growth. So looking at the future, this is gonna be a, quite a challenge. But more, more fundamentally, while many countries that have undertaken the transition from being poor countries to, to richer countries uh, have experienced, the, the one, one of the common features is that they experience uh, an increase in agricultural productivity. That is part of the structural transformation that countries like the ones in East Asia have undergone. In India, during this period of rapid growth, agricultural productivity has been especially low. It's lower than many, poorer, many countries that are poorer than India, and certainly nowhere near the levels of agricultural productivity that the East Asian countries uh, have, have experienced. And that's quite troubling, because if you don't get that increase in agricultural productivity, you may never have the structural transformation you need for uh, embarking on uh, industrialization and, 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 uh, and, and growth. The second aspect that's troubling is the fact that while there's been this growth, there's been very little growth in formal sector employment. You know, no, normally when you see countries like China grow, you see a huge increase in uh, employment in the manufacturing sector, in the, in the formal sector. In India, the share of the labor force that's in the formal sector is again one of the lowest in the developing world and it's lower than, than poorer countries like Bangladesh, uh, it's lower than Sri Lanka, for instance. I mean, people worry about the, the, the paucity of formal sector employment in Sri Lanka, uh, and India's is about half the, the share of the labor force that's in uh, the formal sector in India. And so this is, this is really quite, getting quite serious. Um, in, 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 a, in a country that's so big and growing so fast, most, most of that employment growth has been in the informal sector, and the formal sector has basically been stagnant. Um, in addition, while income poverty has been going down and, or consumption poverty has been going down, some of the health uh, indicators are troubling. So, for instance, India's infant mortality rate, again, is one of the highest among low, low and lower middle income countries, it's higher than Nepal and Bangladesh, for instance, which are poorer countries than, than India. So you have a large percentage of children who are dying uh, before their first birthday in India, and just, you know, basically of this sample, the only country that seems to be higher is Myanmar, uh, which is a country coming off of a civil war and, and, and so on. And then uh, another troubling aspect uh, on the human dimension uh, is the, the low levels of learning uh, in, in education. I mean, it, basically everybody has been going to school. The, the enrollment rate, primary enrollment rate is almost 100% in India. But these children who are going to school every day, it's not clear they're learning very much. So uh, there's a, for the World Development Report this year, we put together comparable levels of learning. And the statistic, the most striking statistic, is that for uh, children in rural India, the second grade students in rural India, 80% of them could not read a single word in a paragraph in their own language. And about 80% 
could not do a two-digit subtraction problem. Uh, this, is, this is shocking. If you think about the fact that these children are going to school every day, um, then you wonder what they're doing. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But then the other thing that go, somewhat goes unnoticed, but is, again, very important for, for development, particularly for the, for the health indicators, is the quality of water. And in India, during this period of rapid growth, and as some of you might know, the, the, the growth was concentrated in the southern states, in Bang in, 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 and in the cities in the southern states, like Bangalore and Chennai and uh, Hyderabad. In these cities, the quality of water, while the economy was growing, the quality of water was declining. And the, one, the measure of the quality of water is the number of hours per day that you have water running through the taps. Because basically, if there's an interruption in the water supply, then all sorts of impurities come in, and then it's very hard to get it out. And in, in these cities, say in Bangalore, in the 1980s, you had 24-7 water, or close to 24-7 water. By the, by the 2000s, you had two to four hours a day of water. Um, and this, you know, again, is a, uh, a phenomenon going through one of the most dynamic cities in, in, the, in the world. Uh, right? So something, something is fundamentally going wrong here uh, in, the, in this, this supposed development success story with high growth, low po uh, uh, rapid poverty reduction, and uh, uh, some very serious development challenges or development shortfalls. Now, what I, as, as Indrajit uh, alluded to, what I wanted to try to uh, describe to you or convince you of is that most of these problems are really due to very well-intentioned and absolutely impeccable from an economic point of view interventions that were introduced in order to overcome market failures. But every single one of these has backfired. These, these exact same, the same interventions that were designed and probably designed by economists, maybe some in this room, uh, to, uh, in order to overcome uh, market failures, have turned into a, a, a government failures uh, for different reasons. And I'm going to try to classify those reasons in a minute. And as a result, they are, they are leaving the economy stuck in a low-level equilibrium that's going to be very difficult, that is very difficult, to get out of. So let me just proceed. Basically, what do I mean by that? Market failures are, there are really only two types of market failures in, in standard uh, neoclassical economic theory. They are public goods and externalities. And these are, when, when you have something like a public good, you know, clean air and things like that, or um, a, a, a bridge or a dam, those aren't going to be provided by the market. And so you need government to go in there and make sure that they're provided. And it's the same thing with externalities. And that is the rationale for government intervention. That's the, that's the rationale for public policy. Now, I want to include, because it's going to be important, one other rationale for public intervention, which is not a market failure per se, but it's a perfectly legitimate rationale for public intervention, which is redistribution. So you could have an economy with no distortions. You could have no externalities and no public goods, but you might still find that the distribution of income is uh, somewhat unequal or not what society would like, and so government has to intervene in order to redistribute income from rich to poor. And that's another rationale for government intervention. Now, if you look at it from this point of view, these, the, the government intervened in India on, based on, on, the ration, on these three rationales in a number of areas, including some of the ones I talked about, like health and education and water, um, and agriculture, but for four reasons, uh, one of four reasons, uh, each of those has uh, backfired. So let's start with the first, 
And that is the, the market failure or the externality associated with, with fertilizer. So, you know, they introduced, they, introduced fertilizer, they introduced fertilizer in the 1950s. And it was a new technology then. Um, people didn't really know what to do with it. So farmers, quite rightly, were reluctant to adopt it because there was a risk associated. They didn't know what it was, whether it would do any good, even though we, we said that it was going to increase their yield and their productivity. But as a result, farmers were quite rightly skeptical. So, and, and if a farmer did happen to use it and it worked, then all the other farmers would learn from that by observing it. And they would get the externality associated with the, the, the experience of that one farmer. But of course, if all farmers thought that way, then none of them would do it, or very few of them would, uh, would undertake the, 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 uh, the fertilizer. So that, and so you can do it from a purely standard economic point of view. You can justify this, that there's a market for fertilizer. There's a cost or a supply curve for fertilizer. There's a private demand for fertilizer. And so with no government intervention, there'll be a level of fertilizer use that the private market would, would provide. But we know that the value of fertilizer is greater than that because th this private demand is based on the farmers, individual farmers' perception of the risk associated with that fertilizer. Whereas if, if the government knew, knew that the fertilizer would actually be in everybody's interest, the social, the social marginal benefit of fertilizer is higher than the private benefit. And these are the circumstances under which it makes sense for government to subsidize the fertilizer. So they subsidize it so that the pri instead, of, instead of being at that low level of the private equilibrium, the Q star, you can move to the higher one by providing a subsidy to the farmers for undertaking the fertilizer. So you can get more farmers to adopt fertilizers. Basically, the government is internalizing the cost of learning, the cost of the information uh, derived from the experience with fertilizer. So that was, a, that was the rationale where the Indian government introduced a fertilizer subsidy. But this was 70 years ago, right? Today, there is no uncertainty about the fertilizer. They already know the fertilizer, uh, the, the benefits of fertilizer. There's nothing to learn about it. Put another way, that externality has gone away. But the subsidy remains. They haven't taken the subsidy away, even though the whole rationale for that subsidy has gone, has gone away. And th you can see just from that diagram why it's gone, uh, why it's, uh, the subsidy remains is because there are at least two groups of people who benefit from that subsidy. One are the farmers, and typically the, the large farmers benefit more because they have more use of the fertilizer because they're paying a cheaper price than they would have to pay if you took away the subsidy. The other are the producers of the subsidy, uh, of the fertilizer, because the producers are now getting that extra, extra rent by, because of the subsidy, whereas if they weren't able to, uh, if there were no subsidy, they wouldn't make as much profit. So you've got the, subs the, the fertilizer producers and the fertilizer c consumers in a coalition to preserve that subsidy. And some of those are large farmers. As I said, they're very powerful. And in fact, the fertilizer corporation is very powerful as well. And it's very difficult to get rid of that subsidy. So, and that subsidy is actually what is undermining agricultural productivity in India today. Because, first of all, there's a huge fiscal cost, costs about $11 billion a year, um, which is, and by the way, you might, since Arvind Subramaniam is coming on Monday, you might ask, <laughs> ask him about this, because he tried very hard. <laughs> he made this the theme of his economic survey to try to get rid of this fertilizer subsidy. It hasn't, hasn't gone away yet. Um, uh, and you know, he calculated this to be something like 0.8% of GDP. It's the largest, largest uh, subsidy in the agricultural uh, budget. But then it's also a regressive subsidy. 
it's the rich farmers, it's the large farmers who benefit more because they consume much more of the of, of fertilizers. But the, this, the subsidy actually distorts the mix of inputs that go into agriculture because it's a subsidy of one kind, it's for urea. And so the amount of urea versus other types of chemicals is, 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 is biased, it's distorted. And that actually is undermining agricultural productivity. And what makes it worse is that today what we're finding is that the, subs the fertilizer, cre the, the runoff, the water runoff from the fertilizer actually creates this thing called eutrophication of the water, which damages plants. It doesn't actually help, in this, instead of helping plants grow, it's actually making it more difficult for them to grow because of, that, uh, of the, the, the water runoff. And it's also a health hazard to, to people who drink the water. Uh, that's contaminated with fertilizer, and it's been known to kill fish, destroying the fish. So, th th you know, this is a classic case for where you want to tax fertilizer. The negative externality that's being caused by fertilizer use. So something that we should be taxing so that they would use less of it is still being subsidized. And this is actually standing in the way of agricultural productivity growth in India. Today, 70 years later, well, once, once you committed the original sin, it's very difficult to, 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 to walk away from it. Okay, so that's one reason is when the, when, when the market failure goes away, it's very hard to backtrack uh, on the intervention. Now, let me now turn to another case where there is a market failure, a perfectly good market failure, but they chose the wrong instrument with which to intervene. And that is in the area of health. Because in, in the area of health, there are actually two kinds of market failures. On the one hand, there's communicable diseases you know, that, that for which you have immunization programs. That's a classic externality too, right? Because if I'm immunized, then I'm less likely to infect you. So you benefit from my, my immunization, I benefit from your immunization, and there again, if, you're, uh, the private, if you leave it to the private market, you may not get the optimal level of immunization. So if the government subsidizes everybody's in, uh, immunization, you get everybody immunized and you're able to protect the population. So that's a classic case of a subsidy. But that's, that's only one, one aspect of the health, uh, health sector. The other is non-communicable diseases, things like heart attacks and strokes and diabetes and things like that which are, by the way, increasing in importance as countries grow. Um, and for those, it's a very different point because there, there's no externality. I mean, if I get a heart attack, I don't infect you, uh, uh, right? What th that really is, it's really a question of the, 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 the aspect of uh, non-communicable diseases is that there's a high cost if you do have a heart attack, the, the treatment is very, very expensive. And secondly, you don't know when you're going to have it. So it's an uncertain event. For, for the, that kind of situation, what you need is an insurance scheme where you contribute something every year, and then when you have a heart attack, they take care of you. They pay for it. Right? That's a very, and that's a very different type of government intervention because the, the, the intervention that's required there is for government to regulate the insurance market. Because we know from various economic theories that an unregulated insurance market is likely to fail. So you need two different types of instruments. You need the, ex the subsidy to solve the externality problem associated with immunization, and you need insurance or regulation or, or even publicly provided insurance in order to solve the problem of non-communicable diseases. But instead, what do they do? They just decided to subsidize the whole thing. So India decided, like other countries we know, such as the one we're in, to provide free universal health care, um, publicly provided a free uh, universal health care. What was the result? Well, let me just give you one example. This is the incidence, or the distribution, of these healthcare subsidies across 
the, the different income quintiles of the population. And what you can see is that the, the lion's share, 33% of the health expenditures, goes to the richest 20% of the population. And less than, little under 10% goes to the poorest quintile. And it's a perfectly increasing uh, line. And the reason for that, as you can see from the, the color, the blue line, the, the dark blue, uh, is that the biggest share of that expenditure is the expenditure on hospitals. Now, the reason is because they, don't, they didn't go for an insurance system, these hospitals play the role of the insurance system. That's, you, if you have a heart attack, you need to go to the hospital. Or if you need some surgery, you go, you go to the hospital. Right. And the important thing is, in the absence of an insurance market, rich people and poor people both have need for these hospitals. But the rich people have more political power, and so they're able to make sure those hospitals are located near where they live. So most of the hospitals are located in urban areas, because if, if, you, if you have a heart attack, you want a hospital near you. And so most of the spending goes to urban hospitals, and since it's so expensive, it's most of the spending total that goes there, and that benefits the richest 20% of the population. So the minute you, you miss the boat by saying, let's provide it for free for everybody, it gets captured by the rich at the expense of the poor. It's actually worse than that, because if you notice, the spending on primary health centers, the, the turquoise or whatever you call that color <laughs> um, below, is a little bit more equally distributed across the quintiles. But that's equally distributed because those primary health centers are usually in, in rural areas where the poor live or in, in peri-urban areas and things like that. But the problem is that's just the spending on the primary health centers. But if these are in rural areas and the service is provided for free, what you have is another phenomenon, which is that the doctor is frequently absent. So if you look at the primary health centers, what you find is that the average absentee, about 40% of the time, the doctor is not there. There, there, is, no, there is no doctor. Right? Two days, two out of five days. And part of the reason is, again, the, the service is provided for free. The doctor gets paid whether he shows up or not. There's a lucrative market in the private sector. Many of these doctors are also doing private practice, sometimes back in the urban areas, even though they're assigned to a rural, a rural clinic. And so, some, in some clinics, they've never seen the doctor who has been assigned, uh, assigned there. And this, this absentee rate is, is it's quite striking because it's, it can go up to things like 67% uh, in, in places like Bihar. It's actually another thing that's interesting. These, these states, the different states of India are ranked by their per capita income from the poorest to the richest. And you notice it's not a, it's not a declining scale. Some, some of the richer states like Tamil Nadu, uh, Haryana, and Punjab have very high absentee rates. Well, that's because the private, the private market is much more lucrative there. So you, it's not necessarily correlated with poverty. The, the, the doctor has many more, uh, many more options. In fact, it's even worse than that. Because the shortage of doctors, the, the, uh, or the absence of doctors in the uh, primary clinics, it's not quite a shortage, it's actually just the absence of the doctors, um, has led to a market for unqualified private sector doctors who Amartya Sen calls the quacks. Um, I mean, and these guys are really scary. <laughs> they really have no qualifications. But they put up a shingle, and the difference is they're always there. And they charge you something, you go in there, and you know, when, when your kid is sick, you're desperate, right? You, you, you can't take the kid to the, the public clinic because there's no doctor there, you go to the private clinic. But even more disturbing than that, so we've done a survey where we compared 
the qualified public sector doctors in Delhi, now this is in poor neighborhoods in Delhi, so these are urban doctors. So we took the, we compared the qualified public sector doctors with the unqualified private sector doctors, the quacks. And what we found was that while the qualified public sector doctors, all of whom had medical degrees, they knew more about the, the symptoms that the patient was exhibiting, the quality of treatment that the unqualified private sector doctors were, given, were giving was better. The average time that the qualified public sector doctors were giving a patient was of the order of a few seconds. It was less than a minute. Basically, they rushed them, they rushed them through hoping that they will come to their private practice in the evening. Whereas the, the unqualified private sector doctor, since he gets paid, depending on whether he gives good service, will sit there with the patient, give them some, some palliative, which sometimes works, and that, that, that quality of service is better. So, I mean, think about it, you know, think about how much money was invested in training this qualified public sector doctors. And this is the kind of service you give them. And there was no money, in, no medical school money invested in training the unqualified doctors, but they're still able to give better service. This is the government failure that we're faced with for having chosen the wrong instrument to solve the market failure in the first place. Now third, let me turn to education, which I alluded to before, where there I think they got the, they got the instrument right, um, but they forgot that just because you get the instrument right, it doesn't mean that the public sector actually responds in the way that you think they would, and certainly not in the way that a market would. I mean, basically, as you remember, I was saying these children are going to school every day, but the second graders, the rural second graders, couldn't read a single word in a paragraph, and they couldn't do a two-digit subtraction problem. And this is, you know, it's a, it's a bit of a mystery. And, and the instrument, by the way, was, again, free public uh, education, publicly provided, publicly financed education which you can make a case that there are externalities associated with education and there's some um, uh, reasons why you want to have it as a public, uh, a public system. Now the problem here is that you deliver it as a public system and you still end up with a phenomenon that 25% of the time the teacher is absent. And that's the average absentee rate it varies from about 15% to about 40% in India. That's two out of five, the 40%, the, the Jharkhands and the Bihar, two out of five days the, doc, the, the teacher isn't there. So then it's not surprising that these children aren't learning to read. In fact, I've seen, I've visited some of these schools. Actually, was, I actually administered those tests and it's really quite d demoralizing because you give the kid a piece of paper with a, this paragraph written and the kid literally doesn't know which way to turn the page. They're sort of rotating it around. And these children have been, you know, are seven years old or eight years old. Um, the, but the second thing is that, um, the, the, you know, you go visit a classroom and the teacher is absent and sometimes you find that one of the kids goes to the front of the classroom because they know somebody has to be there and there's, there's no teacher there. They're trying to teach these kids who can't read are trying to teach other kids who can't read. And that's the, that's the norm. It's not even an unusual event. That seems to be a, a standard event. Now, how did we get here? Well, again, the teachers paid whether or not they, they uh, show up for work. They all have permanent contracts. They have options to earn outside, which they're able to exercise. This is another case where you find that the, some of the highest absentee rates are in some of the richest states. Punjab, for instance, uh, has, has some of the highest uh, teacher absentee rates. But it's actually worse than that. It's even harder to, 
to overcome because in, in India, the teacher runs the political campaign of the local politician. So the teacher runs the campaign to make sure the politician gets elected. The politician turns around and gives the teacher a job for which they don't have to show up. And they tolerate that. And so the teacher, the politician's happy, the teacher's happy, and unfortunately the children lose. Um, and again, you can see how difficult that is to overcome. Once, once you're stuck in that equilibrium, trying to break out of it, there's always pressure. Actually, I mean, give you one other factoid. So in the, um, in the state of Uttar Pradesh, which is a state in India, but it happens to have 200 million people, so it's bigger than any country in Africa. In Uttar Pradesh, in the state legislature, 20% of the, of the legislators are teachers. And another 20% are former teachers. So good luck trying to get any education reform in, in UP. And, that, and that's the, the, the system we're, we're, we're faced with. Um, and then finally, let me turn to the case that I mentioned in passing, where there's no market failure in the sense of no public good or externality, but the government intervened anyway, and the government intervenes anyway, mostly on grounds of equity, on, on redistribution. So even if there's no uh, no, mar uh, no market failure, you need government, uh, government intervention in order to solve the, the, the redistribution problem. And this is where the water problem that I mentioned earlier, the quality of water, is coming into play. Because water is where they intervene. Water, drinking water, is not, there's no market failure associated with that. It's not a public good. If I, it's not non-rival. If I drink a glass of water, you can't drink that same glass of water. Right? Um, and there's no externality associated with that. If I drink it, I get the, get the pleasure of it. You don't get to enjoy it at, uh, uh, at all. And yet we intervene on grounds, governments intervene, and the way they intervene is to provide water for free or at subsidized, highly subsidized rates in, um, in order to make sure that poor people have access to water. Because you need water for life, you need water to, to live, and so you, you say you can't, you can't leave poor people without access to water, so let's subsidize it. Now, when you try to have this discussion with, especially with Indian, in Indian administrative service officers, they always say, you know, and you sort of show them these quality, uh, these quality indicators, these declining quality indicators, they always say, oh, it's because there's, there was a drought. There's a shortage of water because of natural circumstances. These are dry areas, right? So we did, we, we, we went in and checked it out. <laughs> so what we did was to compare the stock of water available in a whole range of Indian cities with the quality of water in that, in that same city measured by the number of hours per day of water that was available. The stock of water is what's given in the red line on the left, which is in liters per capita per day. So that's the available water in that city. And the yellow line is the number of hours of water available in that city. And what you find is that the, the stock of water has almost nothing to do with the availability of water. So you take a city like Batinda, which is the fourth from the bottom, which has 106 liters per capita per day and has only eight hours of water per day. Then you go up to Darabasi, which is in the middle. Darabasi has 173 liters per capita per day, but still only has eight hours of water flowing through the pipes. And at the top, you have Goa, which has 341 liters per capita per day and still has only eight hours of water per day. And then you have Paris, which I know Paris is not an Indian city. Um, Paris, which does have 24 hours of water per day, but has only 150 liters per capita per day. It's kind of the median of all of these Indian cities. So what's going on here? 
And this is another case where the, the intervention actually backfired because when you subsidize water, when you provide or, or, or provide water for free, you give a lot of power to the politician over the water utility because it's the politician who gets to transfer the subsidy to the water utility. The utility needs money in order to just pump the water out. But now they get paid by the, by the political uh, forces rather than by the customer. And politicians, if, since they con therefore control the utility because they're the ones who decide on the subsidy, they can force the utility to send the water to their own political constituencies. And that's what they do. So you find some neighborhoods are getting the water in the pipes, and other neighborhoods are completely left out. And since, as we said before, poor people need water, what they end up doing is having to buy water from water vendors who come through in trucks and then you bring your bucket and you fill it up. And the amount they pay these water vendors is five to 16 times the meter rate. They're basically gouging these people because they're desperate, they need water. And these are the poor people who are having to, who, who are left out. So if, if you think about it, the, the, if you can double or triple the meter rate but have the water then flow to their neighborhoods, these people will be better off. Because they're paying less than what they'll have to, they'll get to pay less than what they're paying now. It's very expensive being poor, as they said, right? Uh, in, this, in this world. But you can see how this is politically very difficult because what you're saying is, let's raise the meter, the, the, the price, so that we can help poor people. They'll say, you know, they say to me, Shanta, you're crazy, right? <laughs> The problem with poor people is that they don't have any money. And you think you can make them better off by, uh, by uh, raising the price? The answer is yes. But you can see how politicians who recognize that this is taking away their power can easily resist that kind of reform. They can say, though, this is neoliberal uh, <laughs> World Bank orthodoxy. Uh, 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 and, and say, so, and, you know, I think this, this cartoon kind of summarizes it uh, well for me because the politician says, elect me and I promise you free water. And the person says, well, we never got your free water, so we'd rather pay for it. In fact, there was a case in Andhra Pradesh where the, the government did experiment by charging for water. Actually, this was for irrigation water to, to farmers who were before not getting the water or getting it intermittently. The minute they started charging for it, they, they got the water regularly so they were able to use it during the harvest season and, and things like that, during the planting season and, and so on. And we went back and interviewed the farmers and one farmer actually said, we will never again allow the government to give us free water. They understood. But that's, that was just one case in Andhra Pradesh. Overall, we have this problem in every major city in India, that the, uh, the, the, water, the, uh, the water board and the, and, the, and the political leadership just resists every step of the way uh, to try to increase water pricing uh, because it takes away the power. Because then, you know, if you increase the water prices, then the customer decides where the water goes, not the politician. And you can see how that can make it difficult for them to, uh, to win, their, win their elections. So this is the situation. Now you can see why India is facing all of these problems, which is the, 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 the health problems, the education problems, the agricultural productivity problems, all of which came out of well-intentioned, perfectly respectable economic interventions uh, to solve market failures or redistribution that for the four reasons that I mentioned earlier uh, actually backfired. They didn't deliver what they were supposed to deliver, which is to correct the market failure. But we're stuck now because each of these has created a political interest group 
that has an interest in keeping those interventions there, and if those groups are powerful, it's going to be very difficult to break out. So what can we do? Um, and the, you know, there's no magic solution to this, but I think this is where we need to, this is where economists need to focus on, including economists at the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, I would say, uh, which is when you think about this problem, you know, you've got these special interest groups, you've got the politicians, you've got the, the teachers' unions, you've got the medical unions, you got the uh, fertilizer producers, all of these groups that are benefiting from the current status quo, right? But there's a large number of people who are losing, particularly the poor. And there are millions, hundreds of millions of them in India. And they vote, by the way. In fact, the poor vote in much larger numbers than the rich. Um, uh, and so, if there's some way in which we can harness the, pow the power of numbers of the poor to demand what is their due. I mean, they're the ones that public policy is supposed to help, but they're the ones that public policy is hurting right now. Um, if we can get, get them in a position where they can demand from the politicians what is their due, we might be able to bring about change. Now, why isn't that happening? I mean, why aren't they demanding their due? And I think, I mean, there are lots of reasons, but one of them is actually that people don't necessarily vote along public policy lines when it comes to elections. In some parts of India, they vote by their caste or their ethnic group and things like that. Now, if the politician knows that, then the politician has very little incentive to deliver public goods. They just curry favor with, the, the, uh, with their own ethnic group, usually providing them with private goods. I mean, it's very interesting. You know, there's a lot of evidence that politicians who provide roads tend to win elections, and politicians who provide good education or good health care lose elections. And one reason for that is Rhodes provides jobs to that particular group living in that neighborhood. And, and the point is that if people don't expect anything more than just a, 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 a temporary job from the politician, then they will vote for him for providing that job, even though the kids aren't getting educated and the, and the uh, children are dying from uh, poor water. So if we can turn that around in some way, then we might be able to get people to start voting along public policy lines. And then politicians might recognize that if they deliver along the public policy lines, they might be able to, to um, that, that they might get elected. And then you might create a virtuous cycle where you can get out of these, these government failures. And you know, I, I just give you one anecdote, I mentioned it this morning as well. I, when I did a village immersion program, I lived with a poor woman in Gujarat, in western India. Uh, you know, cooked with her, worked in the fields with her, and did everything with her uh, for, a, for a week. And there was one, one day when her kid was sick, and she, she took him to one of these quacks. The, the, the unqualified private doctor. Right? She took him to a private doctor. I'm pretty sure he was unqualified, sort of looked unqualified. Uh, and, and so I said, you know, why, why didn't you take him to the, uh, the public clinic? You know, it's just down the road. And she looked at me like I was just, you know, from Mars, right? And she said, well, the doctor's never there, which is true. And so then I said, why is the doctor never there? And she said, oh, it's because the rains didn't come this year, right? You know, the, the, I think if you're poor, if you're destitute, life is just terrible. And you associate the doctor not being there as just one of those things that makes your life miserable. Just like the rains, you know, the drought. Right? And of course, if that's what you think, if that's the way you think, then, of course, he's not going to vote for somebody who, who, who is failing to uh, deliver uh, 
the doctor in the clinic, the free doctor in the clinic. And of course, then the politician knows that and there's no incentive to deliver on the clinic. So that was when I decided that I would want to change that by saying, let, let's try to get this information. I mean, we know why the doctor wasn't there. We can document it. We can even document the fact that the doctor has not been there for a long time or consistently not there. Let's get this information to these people. Let's provide this information that we, you know, we spent hours doing this analysis and trying to generate data uh, along these lines. Let's actually get it to the public in such a way that they can start demanding. And it just give you an example of, uh, of, of a case in Uganda where this did have an effect, which was um, a, a case where we did a survey where we asked the question, what percentage of the money that was meant for public primary schools actually arrived at the school? And the answer was 13%. And that was an average with a distribution around that average when some schools got zero. But the government of Uganda, when they found the study, actually publicized it. They put it on the radio and the billboards all over the place. And when people heard about it, they started demanding, people in the district started demanding to know how much money was coming to their district. And the newspaper had to publish that amount every month. When they found out how much money was coming to their district, then the parents went to the school and asked the headmaster, saying, now we know how much money you're getting, how come my kid says there's no, there are no textbooks in the classroom, there's no furniture in the school? And so the headmaster then had to publish the school budget on the schoolroom door. To this day, you can see the budget posted on the schoolroom door. And that number went from 13% to 90% just from that pressure of information, giving people information and letting them build pressure from, from below. So I think we can make progress, and there, there are lots of other examples. I just like to illustrate this because the Uganda one is quite graphic, uh, where information has actually made, uh, made a difference. But how we do it is, is actually complicated. Um, first of all, what kind of information, but also, paying attention to how people receive information. Giving this information just by putting it out there may not always work. I mean, in Uganda, we got lucky. And you can see from here that sometimes different parts of the world, people receive information differently. In, in sub-Saharan Africa, most people get their information from the radio. Whereas in, in South Asia, for instance, there's quite a bit from newspapers. Uh, now, that tells you something about how to disseminate this information. But actually, I think we can go further. And we are trying to go further. Um, and some of my colleagues at the World Bank are working with uh, an NGO, a couple of NGOs in, in South India, to say, you know, it's still the case that this is information that we collect, we as economists, we know what information to collect. So we go in there, and do these surveys, collect the information, and then you know, we're trying to do a better job of getting this information back to the public. But what if you ask people, ask those same people, what kind of information you should be collecting? Because we always think that we're the cognoscenti, right? We know, we know what, what's good for them. So we'll go there and ask them questions about how much they eat and how much they drink, and, how much they uh, spend on clothing, and then we'll go back and analyze the data and tell them uh, what, their, uh, what their life is like. And there's a fascinating experiment going on, and if you'll indulge me, I wanna just show you a very short video clip. I hope the sound will work. Um, where instead of doing this, we've reversed the process where before we do these surveys, we go in and we ask the people, what kind of questions should we ask you? if we wanted to understand what can improve your lives? And the answers you get, are, they're very different from what... Yeah. 
What normally happens in development projects, actually anywhere, is that some researcher will do a survey, take the data away with them. So having spent two, three hours with some family collecting that information, the data will be analyzed in some place, maybe in some air-conditioned office in America. That will then become a research paper. Then some government official may or may not read that research paper. And that may or may not affect policy, but will ultimately affect the beneficiary sitting who spent two, three hours of their time giving this, answering the survey questions. Feed tracking is an attempt to change that equation, to essentially reverse that process. Feed tracking really is an attempt to give data back to the people for their own purposes. In other words, it's an attempt to use data as an empowerment tool. We try to collect data that is relevant to people. We used women's networks, self-help group networks, to sit and think about what were the issues they wanted to track, what were the outcomes they wanted to track year after year, things, their aspirations, the things they dreamed of. Ultimately, they came up with a half an hour questionnaire that they developed entirely. Questions about alcoholism, questions about domestic violence, about intra-household decision-making, a whole host of things that really truly mattered to them. That was the design of the questionnaire, entirely participating. <laughs> So feed tracking is, is a large survey that tracks indicators of livelihoods and empowerment for one million women in the state of Tamil Nadu. What's different about this survey compared to other surveys is that it is participatory both in its design and implementation and it fo focuses fundamentally on how data will be used by the same women who designed and implemented this survey. Finally, I want to end with a note of caution. Um, I mean, it's easy. The economists also get very excited about information and, and data. <laughs> we love data, right? Um, and it's easy for us to say, think that this information dissemination or even this empowerment tool like the P tracking can actually work. But we have to keep in mind these are people who are working 14 to 16 hour days just to put food on the table. They're literally, you know, they're in the field 12, 12 hours a day, they come home and they have to cook dinner and, and w do whatever else there is. And now we're expecting them to go to some town meeting and receive all this information that we want them to learn, right? There's, there might be problems of capacity here that we have to ha be realistic about. We're, we're asking some of the, the hardest working, most vulnerable people in the world to absorb even more information. And this came home to me once because we did a survey in Uttar Pradesh uh, of a project which is similar to some of the ones we're talking about where the government uh, would send money to a village education committee, the VEC, in order so that they, the village education committee could then decide how to use this money for improving education. They could use it to uh, hire another teacher or uh, buy curriculum materials or, or whatever. They would just decide it. They got, they got a grant. And this program had been going on for 10 years where the VEC would meet regularly to decide what to, uh, how to spend the money. And 10 years into the program, we went back into the village and asked, just ask one simple question. How many of you have heard of the VEC? And 92.4%, 93% had never heard of the VEC. Right. Even more distressing, of the remaining 7%, so 7% had heard of the VEC, we asked one follow-up question. We said, can you name a single member of the VEC? And of that 7%, 5% of the total, which is like 70% of the people who had heard of the VEC, could not name a single member of the VEC. And this included people who were themselves members of the VEC. Right? So you have to be, have a sense of proportion here that, even, and 
10-year-old program, which is supposed to provide information and empower people, still may not be actually catching, uh, uh, catching on. But that said, I think getting, getting information to poor people might be one of the most powerful ways of overcoming the government failures that are standing in the way of them escaping poverty. Thanks very much.